Hello everyone, I am here with a candidate running to represent Arizona's first congressional district. Her name is Eva Putsova, and she is here to tell us about her campaign. Eva, thank you so much for coming on the program. Thank you for having me. I am really excited to see that you're running for Congress because I looked a little bit at your record when you served in city council for um, Flagstaff. And before we even get started, I have to go over some of the things that you accomplished because this this is really remarkable. So first of all, you were instrumental in increasing Flagstaff's minimum wage to 1550. You initiated the city's first climate action plan. You led the charge to pass an Indigenous Peoples Day. Uh, you passed the resolution encouraging Congress to act when it comes to dreamers and immigration reform. So you were incredibly effective. And now you want to take what you've learned in Flagstaff to Congress. So tell us what made you decide to make the jump to national politics? Well, uh, we face urgent challenges, healthcare, climate change, immigration, inequality, racism, and we can no longer accept timid, hesitant leadership that prioritizes corporate interests. We must put people first. And this is really why I'm running. Uh, I'm not afraid. I think um, that we need uh, a very different Congress. Uh, we need uh, people in Congress who cannot be bought by corporate interests. And uh, uh, we need those who are ready to fight and work for the people of this country. And it's really great to see everyone just kind of standing up and running. And what I'm seeing is just ordinary people who are choosing to run for Congress, you know, truck drivers, people who just are working every day, nine to fives. And that's really great. And I love your story. And I kind of wanted you to talk about this because you became a citizen in 2007. You're from Slovakia. Tell us a little bit about yourself and, you know, what it's like to fight from the perspective of being, you know, an immigrant who moved here and seeing all the vitriol that are being, you know, spe that's being spewed by the president and Republicans disproportionately towards Latin American immigrants. How does that like how do you process that as an immigrant yourself? Yeah, so, uh, you know, as you mentioned, I became a U.S. citizen in 2007, and the journey to become a U.S. citizen took about seven years. And uh, so I understand uh, what you have to go through when uh, the case is straightforward and there are no complications, and just uh, how much paperwork, uh, how much money uh, one needs to uh, stay in the process until um, they become naturalized. What I also realized during this process is that um, we all have privileges, but they're relative. So when I was waiting in line uh, to be seen by immigration officer, there were many other people in Phoenix standing in line with me, uh, many of them people of color, many of them with uh, maybe their English wasn't uh, as perfect. And I saw the different treatment that um, was applied on different people. And certainly, uh, color of the skin uh, is a factor. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a white woman, so as a white person, I have certain privilege. Um, I'm a woman, so maybe my privilege in that respect is a little bit less. But then when I open my mouth, everybody can tell that I'm an immigrant. I will never lose my accent. So please don't ask me. <laughs> and, and, and so then my privilege uh, is diminished. Uh, and there are many, many people who are in a much worse um, relative position who face discrimination because who, who they are, where they were born. And um, I think it's wrong. You know, I grew up in, a, um, in a Slovakia, former Eastern Bloc country. Uh, we knocked down the walls and got rid of the borders because, um, you know, as people, we felt we belong to Europe. We belong with everybody else. And I think that's the direction I would like to see this country and to go, not the opposite direction, um, you know, creating barriers um, between people. Everything you say, you know, seeing that firsthand, it really makes sense as to why your entire platform is basically centered around like human compassion. You're a huge advocate for indigenous people's rights and you're fighting for single payer Medicare for all. So there's a lot of things that 
I believe you are going to advocate for and I trust that you will do such a great job because you have this experience. But this is one thing that I always ask the people who are running for Congress. There's so many things that need fixing currently in our country, and I don't know where I would begin personally if I were, you know, elected to Congress. So just within that first year, let's say you're elected, you will obviously join the squad with AOC and Ilhan Omar because you're definitely one of those types of progressives. What do you think you personally would try to fight for the most just within that first year? Because you can't pick everything and it's tough, but what's most important to you? So I do believe that we can do multiple things at the same time, but I do know that everything takes uh, energy and uh, resources. I do think that uh, climate change is something that we cannot postpone. I think the reason why we are where we are with climate change is because um, we had a bipartisan inaction for decades, and that has to stop. I also think that um, because I'm an immigrant, I'm very invested in a complete immigration overhaul. And that's also something that I feel cannot wait. Uh, people are hurting. And then, uh, of course, um, you know, ACA uh, did not really address the cost that uh, we pay for healthcare, And that can be addressed if we move forward with a single payer type of system like Medicare for all. And uh, uh, there's no reason why these are big pieces of legislation, all three of them, but we absolutely need to invest in retooling our economy to be uh, a green economy uh, so we can actually uh, enjoy the health care and that we can uh, take care of all people in a compassionate way, including um, uh, immigrants. And that's fantastic. I like that, you know, you stressed we can do multiple things at once. Um, but yeah, these are absolutely things that I agree with and other issues um, that you care about based on the pledges that you've signed. So you've signed the no fossil fuels pledge. You've signed the pledge to um, codify the 28th Amendment, which basically gets money out of politics. And when Eva, when you look at her website, it's apparent that she's not like mincing words. She's not saying we need to get the dark money out of politics. There's no caveat. She wants to get money out of politics. And that really sets her apart from other people, namely her opponent, because I want to talk about him. His name is Tom O'Halloran. He, nationally speaking, isn't very well known, but he doesn't really stand for much. Like I checked out his website just before jumping on to talk with um, Eva here. And the policies are incredibly vague. There's no plan to reform healthcare. Just this vague, you know, assertion that I'm going to defend Medicare and Social Security. Um, we need to invest in education. And I don't know what any of this means. But when you look at his donors, it becomes a little bit more clear. He takes super PAC money. He took four thousand from AT and T. He's getting money from Steny Hoyer and Nancy Pelosi. So I want to ask you this, Evel, because you're not taking corporate PAC money. You are clearly principled. But one thing that's always interesting to me about these races is it's like David versus Goliath. You are putting yourself at a disadvantage, but it's important because you're demonstrating to people in AZ1 that um, you're principled and you're going to stand up for them. So talk a little bit about the struggles of running a non-corrupted, if you will, campaign um, and how it's a little bit more difficult to do that and what you think you need to do to win because you're not taking that corporate money. Well, uh, you, you're right, you know, we're not taking uh, any money from corporate interests or from a lobbyist. This is completely people-powered campaign. Uh, if the viewers feel inspired, I hope they will visit evaforcongress.com and uh, help us uh, with our campaign um, that puts people first. And uh, of course, you know, it, it is a different way to organize uh, your campaign and the operation. Uh, we depend on uh, uh, people who uh, volunteer with our campaign. Um, we have to organize in a way and be very smart about uh, where and how we spend money. Um, ultimately, I do believe that uh, organized people outperform organized money. You cannot buy enthusiasm. You cannot buy the kind of support that you get from uh, volunteers who are uh, calling voters, who are knocking on the doors, that cannot be bought. And uh, um, I feel that we need to do these kind of campaigns because until we can legislate or change the constitution through an amendment, can we, until we can legislate uh, getting money out of politics, 
we have to have a whole bunch of representatives in Congress who understand how important it is and they uh, run their campaigns with a high level of integrity and they don't allow themselves to be bought by corporate interests. It makes such a big difference, like you can see in the way that they govern. Like when you just compare like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Ilhan Omar to other Democrats, it's clear that there's nothing holding them back. Like if they say they support a policy position, it's not necessarily because there's these lobbyists or, you know, their donors in their ears saying this is what we want you to support. It's just based on them believing what they need to do to help people. And that's why I think that these types of campaigns are getting a lot more popular. We're seeing more and more people like you run for Congress who's not taking corporate money. And, you know, it's evident that other Democrats who are funded by large multinational corporations, they're getting nervous and they don't like this because this makes them look really bad. You know, if you have someone who's challenging you um, and they don't take corporate money, then they're going to have to find a way to convince people that they actually are with them and not with their donors. And that's tough to do in this political climate when most people see that money has too big of an influence, you know, um, in society and in politics. So can you talk a little bit about your opponent, Tom O'Halloran? Because what I like to do with people who aren't challenging like the big names Mm -hmm. um, is have you make the case as to why you're better? Because I think that it's evident when you just look at your website and compare yours to his that you actually stand for something. But you know, for someone who doesn't have a really big name opponent, it is a little bit more difficult to get your name out there because everybody wants to see Steny Hoyer and Nancy Pelosi defeated. But we do have a lot of other Democrats who are just basically keeping the seat warm, who aren't doing anything that needs to go. So talk about Tom O'Halloran, because he seems like he's someone who, I mean, isn't doing much, if anything at all. Why does he need to be challenged, in your opinion? Right. Uh, that, that's a big question for uh, the voters. And I know, you know, who has time to follow any particular representative or, you know, elected of, official in another office closely to keep track of their votes, right? And so, you know, sometimes we learn more about people when they have an opponent in the primary because they're... Um, Vote, their voting record uh, is up for scrutiny. So, you know, in addition to the fact that um, I don't take money from corporate interests and my opponent takes money from health insurance industry and arms industry and private prison industry and essentially every uh, single industry, including sugar lobby, um, in addition to that, uh, I would not cast certain votes that he has Cast. For example, I would not vote to deregulate uh, banks and uh, weaken the Dodd-Frank uh, Act. I wouldn't uh, criminalize immigrants by voting for uh, Kate's law. Uh, I wouldn't uh, weaken just recently the Raise the Wage Act by introducing an amendment that allows future Congress to delay uh, wage increases or pause the wage increases. I think there are many other things that we can uh, look at his voting record and uh, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, but it's not, it's also not what he does, what he, what, but what he doesn't do. And that is to me at the, you know, core of uh, my primary challenge. I'm running because I really think that we can no longer uh, be uh, inactive when it comes to climate change. I really think that uh, we have to pursue large-scale investments in retooling uh, the economy and do so in an equitable way, uh, very much in line how the Green New Deal proposes that we do it. Um, you know, I don't think that uh, just giving um, or including uh, hearing aids in Medicare is sufficient to reform our healthcare system. We really don't have a healthcare system. I don't know uh, how about, uh, you know, your viewers, but I got sick on Memorial Day weekend. It was on Monday. The, in a city of 72,000 people, there was not a single facility where you can go and get care. 
for your health issue. There was an emergency room available. That was it. There wasn't a single urgent care office open, right? A lot of times people talk about, oh, we want to keep our primary doctors, blah, 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 right? Well, most people don't have primary doctors. Um, you know, when I did go to urgent care, my copay was $75, $75 to be seen, you know, for something that maybe I should just stay at home for, but I don't know. I'm not a, you know, professional and it's my help. Um, and so these are the things that, um, our current representative is not addressing, is not addressing the fact that we don't have actually most people do not have access to uh, quality health care we don't have specialists that are available um, near where people live and the cost of health care is um, so high that some people actually choose to take uber to hospital when they should be calling an ambulance because they're um, you know they need actually that kind of care and they're risking um, their health by going to the hospital by Uber. So that's what, what it is. It's, I think we need uh, real leadership in Congress. And I'm so glad that you brought up the Uber example because that is one of the many reasons why, or that I kind of use to demonstrate how dysfunctional our healthcare system is. And I always talk about how, like, how many people do you know that had to do a GoFundMe to pay for medical bills, even if they had insurance? You know, it, it's just, it's crazy to me. And what you said about people not having primary care doctors is so on point because like, I always make the point when people say, well, you know, oh, well, we don't want to get rid of private insurance because people want to keep their insurance. And I always say, no, people actually don't care about their private insurance. They care about their doctors. But I mean, a lot of people don't have primary care doctors. I don't think I've had a primary care doctor since uh, I've been a kid. So these are issues that aren't being talked about. And it really takes someone who has to deal with it, who doesn't have the money and the privilege that someone in Washington has to know what's actually going on. Like Tom O'Halloran, he has healthcare that I'm sure is really solid. So he doesn't deal with all these issues that normal people have to deal with. So it's just, it's nice to see so many people who are not robots, who are regular people running for Congress. It's really refreshing. So I don't think that you have to do much more to convince my viewers. I think that they're fully on board. If you're in AZ1, uh, tell people when the date of the primary is. It's in August 2020, correct? Yes, it's on August 4th. And, uh, you know, we have uh, about one year to go. Um, but um, for people who don't know, uh, Arizona's first congressional district is the 11th largest district uh, in the country geographically. It's actually three times as big as the country where I was born. Uh, and uh, so this is you know, very rural district. Uh, the largest city is Flagstaff, where I am, and that's about, you know, 72,000 people. Um, and so there's a lot of ground to cover, uh, a lot of doors to knock on, and all the calls to make. And so, uh, again, if people go to evaforcongress.com, uh, regardless where they are in the country, they can help us bank. Of course, if they have uh, extra five dollars, they can uh, help us financially. But uh, you know, there's a lot of work, and we have been already um, at this campaign for the last six months. But I want to go back to just point out something about healthcare. You know, we oftentimes talk about you know the cost of healthcare and um, you know how for the individual how it is important that we have Medicare for all. But I think from small business perspective, we should realize that today, small businesses are probably not competitive uh, when it comes to uh, their uh, talent, their labor with uh, large corporations who that can afford to uh, provide health insurance uh, to their employees. And if we had Medicare for all or, you know, single payer type of system and their employees would be covered by this system and some of and these proposals that are on the table actually exclude the first two million dollars of um, uh, payroll from uh, Medicare taxes 
this would hugely benefit small businesses. And so uh, it's not just the individual, you know, individuals that should really be interested in in uh, um, fighting for this, um, what I think is a human right, um, but also from a business perspective. Uh, people will not have to make decisions whether they can uh, seek jobs with small businesses. And that's such a really important way to sell Medicare for All because, you know, we've heard this mentioned before, but I don't think people say that enough. It really is a great selling point for small businesses. So the website is evaforcongress.com, and I'm going to do my usual spiel for Eva that I do for every candidate. This is not just about CD1 in Arizona. This is a national movement. What Eva will be doing is not just fighting for her constituents, but you as well. And my favorite example, because I have a lot of student loan debt, is how Ilhan Omar, she's not my representative, but she just sponsored legislation that would cancel all student loan debt. That affects me personally, and she's across the country. So this is a national movement, and if you can't donate a lot, try to donate your time. If you can't donate your time, maybe a dollar or two dollars, it really does go a long way. Um, and it's important that we elect people like Eva. And this is not going to be the last that you hear from her because um, she's running a great campaign. She's blowing up. So Eva, thank you so much for coming on the program. Is there anything that you wanted to say before we go? Well, thank you for having me. And I'm so excited that, you know, we have so many great candidates around the country running these uh, campaigns and not being afraid to run with high level of integrity without the corporate money and um, by being powered by people. And so it, it's exciting to be part of uh, what, because what we're doing really, we're not just trying to change the policy directions of this country. We are really trying to change the rules of politics. That's such an important point to make. And I'm glad that you brought up all the people running because I, I said this last year in uh, or the year before, um, you know, in 2016, there was like a number of progressives running that maybe I could count on one hand, two hands. In 2018, it got a lot more difficult to keep track of every run that was running who is progressive, you know, grassroots. And now, you know, for the 2020 cycle, there are so many candidates that I, I, I don't even know half of them. So it's just, it's so exciting. We really see this movement materializing. And even if it's easy to be cynical, when you look at the bigger picture and see what's happening and all the people like you who are running um, and rising up, it, it really, it gives me hope. So thank you for running and giving me hope and other people hope. And we will be watching closely because um, I, I'm looking forward to your election. I think you can beat Tom because... Um, I don't know what there is to like there. <laughs> I, I know. I know. We will. Awesome. Thanks. Well, take care. Again, it's evaforcongress.com. Please pitch in and help her get elected.